So we come now to the last three movements, of the last third really, of the Gloria section, the, uh, the big overall section of the Gloria. Um, as we said last week, the Qui Tollis um, starts in B minor and doesn't finish in the key that it starts in. It really sets as a harmonic introduction, as it were, setting up the um, Qui Sedes movement. So it finishes Deprecationem Nostram. then resolves back to B minor, which is our home key, of course, of the whole work. So the last three movements of this section um, then are in B minor, and then the next movements and the one after it are in D major. So we end the glory in the triumphant key of D major. So it's very much of that kind of journey and these, one feels that there's kind of like a, um, that that's what makes these three movements a separate section or part of what makes them up because he's he's using the home key and its journey to the to the relative major the d major um so this piece another very beautiful movement qui sedes it's sung in the recording we're going to hear in a minute by a countertenor obviously we were going to have a um and we'll have a a, a mezzo soprano bach was predominantly writing for boy voices in his um choral writing he was normally working in a liturgical context when um when which would have been boys in his day um of course nowadays it's much less uh it's much more common to have female voices and and personally i'd prefer it um it's a matter of taste really um if you get a really good counter tenor um it's absolutely wonderful um if you get a really bad counter tenor it's absolutely ghastly so you take your you pay your money and you take your choice um but the different voices bring different qualities to it. One thing I think which is, um, again, very special about this piece is the choice of the Obo d'Amore. Um, Silvio will tell you more about uh, the Obo d'Amore than I ever could. But um, in, on one level, it's kind of a halfway house between an oboe and a corongle, in that it's pitched uh, slightly lower than an oboe, so it's slightly longer. Um, and it's got a bit of the uh, the uh, bell-shaped um, uh, the sort of end, which looks a bit like an egg on a corongle. There's a bit of that going on in the obo d'amore. And of course, it means uh, oboe of love, which is a very kind of romantic idea. And the sound is warm, uh, warmer, slightly darker than the, um, than the normal oboe um, and very, very beautiful. Once again, we've got a kind of duet between the instruments. Uh, and the voice. There's an opening instrumental section, you might call it a ritonello, which is like Handel did a lot. If you think of all the arias in Messiah, most of them start with a instrumental version of the tune and then the soloist comes in after 20 bars or so. And that's what we've got here. So the oboe starts with the melody. Which is exactly what the voice has when it comes in in bar 18. Apart from that, it's it's like a, a bit like a duet, not quite so much as the um, other movements, but it is it is a kind of play between um, the, the voice and the oboe. Um, usually, rather than um, Bach in other movements is doing strict canon, where he's taking whole long sections of melody and writing them against one another. This is more a kind of play between the two instruments. So you'll notice that the when the voice comes in, with this qui sedes, then immediately the oboe answers it. And then the voice does, and the oboe answers it. And it's like a, almost like a game between the two of them. And then they actually join together to play the same notes at the same time. And then they go back to the, the thing where they, they take turns. Um, and then, and then the, the next time they join in, um, the voice, uh, when, the, when the oboe and the voice is singing and playing together, the oboe has a little embellishment. Um, so the voice does. In bar 25, and the oboe does. So just a little bit more snazzed up. Um, 
So it's it's a slightly different structure in the in the other pieces, and very much a kind of again a duet between the two. Um, one feels it's like a journey. When the voice finishes at the end of the first section in bar thirty, then the oboe again sets up a new idea. Often we find um, we've talked about various movements which have the start in a home key and then go to the dominant key, um, which is the key of the fifth away. So in B minor. We've got a B, we start on a B. So in the same way, exactly the same way in bar 30, we're up a fifth or down a fourth. One thing to mention also is that there's these kind of uh, lovely string interjections, very gentle, which again is another rhythmic idea which he plays with. And we talked about how Bach often does, as well as note counterpoint, which are lots of notes fitting together, um, often the rhythms fit together as well. So here we have the oboe holding on while the strings do their little interjections there. Um, and again, that's part of what makes it sound so, uh, so balanced in construction. So then the oboe has a, 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 is given a more freedom and has more complicated embellishments and slightly more wide ranging in bar 38 or so. And the, and the central section is, is becomes a bit more involved and you'll notice the voice gets uh, more wide ranging and, and more uh, daring in its, uh, what it's trying to do. So in bar 50, um, we've got these big leaps. And then a couple of bars after that, the voice gets up to um, what I think is its highest note, uh, an E natural. And again, it's no coincidence that uh, Bach uses the highest note to depict the word father. So it's on the right hand of the father, dextron patris. And he, he sets the highest note for the voice on that word. Bach's always, um, nothing like that is ever an accident with Bach. Um, so that again follows. And then we have um, a little adagio section at the end, just a little slow up. Um, it feels like there's going to be a, um, a full recapitulation in this piece. In other words, a, um, a sort of introduction of the um, opening music again, but he doesn't do that. Um, he he just, just finishes it off and leads you, uh, puts it to bed very nicely. And have a listen out in the recording the way the oboe finishes, which is the way that nearly always everybody does it, but they put in an appoggiatura, a very long, scrunchy one, so you've got a clash against the bass. Mm -hmm. 